Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Head Neck Weekly Webinar Series. As you all know, we've been having uh, uh, regular webinars on every Thursdays and Saturdays, and we are into our 16th session now. We've finished with the first module on the neck, and you can find all our uh, videos on our YouTube page, the AHNOK webinar uh, page. You can subscribe to that for further updates and videos. And uh, we are into our second module, which is on the cancer of the oral cavity. Uh, we've had some great speakers join us up till now. We had Dr. Ashok Shah join us for the module on the AJCC uh, eighth edition, uh, you know, the changes in the AJCC eighth edition. And today also we have a fantastic talk lined up on oral cancer screening by Dr. Muni Adhan Suryodose. And we have some more uh, good you know, topics to cover in the next coming weeks. We will begin our next module, which is on reconstruction in the coming months. And uh, this has been, uh, we've, we've been able to achieve this with the collaboration and with the help of our Academia of Head Neck Oncology of Karnataka. So uh, this is affiliated to the Asian Oncology Society. And AHNOK provides a very good platform to budding head neck surgeons as well as the practicing head neck surgeons to uh, you know, uh, network with fellow head neck surgeons in Karnataka. So anybody who would like to join, please, uh, um, you can write to the email ID given here, that is info at ahnok.org and become a member. So uh, just to introduce, uh, to begin with today's session, I think, uh, uh, so I, I'm going to introduce the moderator for today, Dr. Narayana Subramanian, who is a consultant, uh, head neck surgeon and reconstructive surgeon, who is the assistant uh, fellowship director at uh, Mazumdar Shaw Cancer Center. He's been trained at uh, Amrita Institute uh, in Cochin, and he's also uh, trained in the US and Australia. Uh, he is the author of over 80 uh, international peer reviewed uh, publications and has also uh, you know, been an editor for, uh, for a textbook that's coming up in head and neck uh, surgery. So welcome Dr. Narayana. Thank uh, you very much. Um, I hand over the session to you now to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Uh, so Dr. Moni is someone who needs no introduction to most of us uh, because most of us, myself included, are lucky to have had him as a mentor and guide. So he's the director of the Cochin Cancer Research Center, and he was previously the director of surgical oncology at Narayana Hridaya, Bangalore, and uh, the director of Mazumdar Shah Center for Translational Research. So his clinical interests are management of advanced head and neck cancer and skull-based surgery, as well as 3D planning and functional reconstruction. He also has done a lot of uh, novel research work. So his research lab focuses on understanding the biology of uh, oral cancer stem cells and novel technology platforms for early detection of oral cancer. So he has over 200 peer-reviewed publications and five international patents to his credit. He's also the author of a four-volume textbook titled Contemporary Oral Oncology, and he served the FHNO as its past president and is the president-elect of the International Academy of Oral Oncology. So welcome, sir. Over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Narayana. Thank you, Chani, for the invitation. Uh, uh, to be part of this uh, missing uh, lecture series. So uh, let me see whether I can share my screen. Uh, the uh, can you see my screen at all? Shalini, can you not move? Yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not the not the, the presentation. Yeah, now it's good. Now we can see the full screen presentation. I'm going to talk about uh, how technology uh, can be used to reach society in country on cancer. Uh, you can show me or uh, you know, screen the uh, video just now and then I will post and uh, continue. In terms of on, on cancer, it is a disease of uh, this family. Uh, uh, your voice is sounding a little muffled. One minute. Yes, sir. 
Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, much better. Okay, okay, very good. Yeah, I was about to say that I was saying that oral, can oral cancer is a disease of uh, disparity. If you look at the uh, uh, incidence of prevalence of oral cancer, the significant difference uh, from which part of the world you come from. Southeast Asia, unfortunately, has the, the highest burden of uh, oral cancer. And within India, to the risk disparity. This graph uh, doesn't depict the oral cancer, but overall cancer. Uh, there is a red, the more red the, the, the color, the more incidence uh, uh, of a particular uh, cancer. So if you can see that the, the, that the different shades of red at different parts of the country, uh, suggesting that there is a difference in the incidence. When it comes to India, we have about 100,000 uh, uh, new cases every year. And uh, at, uh, at any given time, we have about three times of that, almost like a 350, 400,000 uh, uh, patients uh, living at any time uh, who need uh, cancer care. Now, if you look at the, how the cancer has changed, this is a, a figure from the Lancet Oncology uh, publication about two years ago. Uh, from uh, 1990 to 2018, a lot of cancers, the incidence has come down. One of the cancers which there is an increased uh, incidence is uh, lip and uh, oral cavity. But within the head and neck, if you look at uh, the larynx, incidence actually come down. Okay, so oral cavity incidence is going up, but the larynx uh, incidence is uh, coming down, showing that uh, some of the local uh, risk factors uh, plays a significant role when it comes to uh, causing cancer. Now, another important uh, aspect is that it's not just the high incidence we have uh, in our country, the outcome is also uh, really uh, poor compared to more developed countries. And this paper published many years ago in 2003, uh, comparing the outcome of SEER is a population-based cancer uh, data set from the US versus Mumbai, the Indian outcome is about 20% low, lower than that of uh, the US uh, uh, population. Now, if you go into details uh, within that paper and compare whether you are diagnosed at a, a cancer with a local regional disease, uh, that is with the metastatic disease, the outcome is even worse, about 26%. But the good news is that if you were to diagnose cancer at an early stage, the outcome is comparable, only about 7% difference. Showing that uh, in India, in Mumbai, you get almost same outcome as in New York or some other place, uh, provided you diagnose the cancer at an early stage. Now, the question is how to bridge this disparity. You know, one side we have the high incidence and we have poor outcome. How do we uh, bridge this uh, uh, disparity? And if you look at that, uh, there are fairly simple strategies are available. This is a paper published by Dr. Shankar Maranan way back in 2005. Uh, we are all familiar with this paper. What they did was they just trained some health workers, not doctors, not nurses, just health workers, to go into the community and look inside the mouth to diagnose cancer. And then they looked at the outcome. And the, in the intervention arm, the, uh, the mortality rate was about 30 per 100,000. In control arm, about 45 per 100,000, almost 15% uh, improved outcome uh, by just by diagnosing cancer, not using any high technology, just by training health workers to go into the community and uh, diagnose a cancer at early stage. And they have also shown that this is very, very cost effective to save uh, the cost uh, per life year saved is about uh, 9,000 rupees. So the intervention is so inexpensive and it's very effective. And uh, that is the simplest uh, mode of uh, uh, technology or intervention we have. And if you look at the oral cancer detection technology, there's lots of technology out there in the market, yeah, right from the toluidine blue, some kind of optical imaging technology, cytology, spectroscopy, 
molecular markers and uh, so on. So multiple technologies are available. But if you look at uh, any technology, not just uh, early detection, if you look at any technology in any cancer, and particularly in head and neck cancer, and uh, many such intervention has come in the past. From 90s to 2020, if you look at it, we had uh, chemo radiotherapy came that improved the outcome, then a plato came, and then came cetuximab, robotic surgery, nivolumab, and everything. If you look at that, each of these uh, technological or interventions have added to the outcome of uh, head and neck cancer or oral cavity cancer. And if you continue to do innovation in this uh, format, definitely we're going to increase the outcome, but in a very, very slow pace. But whether the question is whether we can leapfrog this uh, innovation or leapfrog the, the outcome, that's a question we need to, to discuss. And I believe that it is uh, possible. Now, I showed you that data from Times uh, publication and showing that just uh, training the health workers, uh, his group could uh, improve the outcome by 15%. There is no intervention so far in head and neck had this kind of dramatic uh, outcome. No nivolumab, no cetuximab had this kind of uh, improved uh, outcome. But the key question is uh, trained uh, health, health, trained eyes. That is a challenge. That is uh, one of the reasons why uh, this uh, study did, could not be scaled up into a population wide. Uh, wide uh, uh, strategy. Now, that's where the technology can uh, come into play. I just want to pause for a minute and uh, just uh, give plug-in for uh, M Health or Mobile Health. There was a uh, major uh, a conference held by WHO uh, some years ago, about 10, 12 years ago, and looking at uh, how M Health or Mobile Health can improve the outcome. And the uh, report uh, summarized by in one sentence, it has the potential to transform uh, the face of uh, healthcare delivery across the globe. So this is a technology uh, I believe can be adopted uh, in uh, oral cavity cancer um, uh, 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 disparity uh, reduction. Now coming to this uh, technology, most of the time, this technology get adapted in places where there is a need, and that can be quickly adapted. I just want to give an example of a mobile phone. If you look at the mobile phone, the fixed connectivity versus mobile connectivity, it started off in uh, somewhere in the early 90s. It uh, increases uh, exponentially, and uh, sometime in early uh, 2000, uh, the number of mobile connectivity became more than uh, fixed land uh, connectivity. And if you look at uh, where this happened, where this happened, it happened in, uh, definitely happened in, uh, in uh, uh, Europe, but same time it happened in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this figure is about uh, uh, 10 years old uh, diagram that is, but if you look at the number now, India, I'm sure we will have more mobile phone compared to the to this land, uh, landline type of connection. Mainly because there is a this is where there is a need for uh, for um, uh, there is a need for people tend to adopt uh, much uh, uh, faster. This just this talk of giving this talk through Zoom is an example. Using pay for uh, groceries is an example. So we are very good and very good to adopt a technology. So future of health will be mobile first. This is going to be transform uh, uh, healthcare in a big way. And particularly when it comes to oral cavity uh, screen. So let me look at how this mobile technology can help to improve the uh, early detection uh, uh, technology. And if you look at any uh, diagnostic with mobile health, what this uh, tries to do is to connect specialist uh, to the at-risk population. And the, all the people who are listening to this talk, they are experts. I showed you earlier, and look at you, you know exactly what the diagnosis is. But unfortunately, we don't have 
access to where the action happened, that in the community. By the way, we oncologists uh, uh, forget one fact that cancer is not diagnosed by cancer specialists. Cancers are diagnosed by primary care people in the community, and they do not have the, the trained eye we are talking about. And if you look at all the technology I was talking about, including the visual examination or uh, light-based uh, uh, diagnostic adjuncts or cytopathology, if you just to look at the, what would be the end uh, product of that, uh, that uh, uh, technology, they are all images. And if they are images, we can digitize. If we can digitize, we can send remotely that image to be interpreted by a specialist. Even more, it can be it can even bypass that. In the image analysis, machine learning, we don't necessarily need specialists, and uh, that can be the first line help of screen. So let me explain to you how this uh, kind of technology can be used uh, and hopefully improve uh, oral cavity uh, early detection. The first uh, project we took up uh, is something uh, called uh, OncoGrid. Uh, this was done by uh, 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 by Pravin Bayru from KLE, along with us in uh, Narayana uh, many years ago and published uh, two years ago in Canada. So what this uh, uh, project was all about was whether we can replace the eye of a trained uh, health worker who could diagnose cancer like Shanghai's paper with a mobile phone a camera. So if we can do that, then the experts like us listening to the talk not necessarily have to this uh, place where the ca cancer happened. They all the, what we need is a, 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 a health worker go to the community, take an image, send that image to the specialist and then specialists should be able to interpret. That's the whole concept. We started the uh, project uh, way back in 2010 or so, and that was started uh, uh, with the KLE as one of the nodal center and the specialist center as Masundasho Cancer Center. And it was carried out in six uh, primary health centers as well as six uh, dental colleges. I will not go into details of this uh, project, so essentially what uh, it did was uh, it uh, stratified whether the, uh, can you see my screen, uh, Ryan? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, just got uh, disconnected. Okay, okay. One minute, okay. Okay, can you see, can, you can still see it, is that right? Yeah, we can see your screen. And then the health worker can take uh, pictures and these pictures can be zoomed and, uh, and uh, interpreted by the, by the specialist and the specialist can comment on it. And uh, this study had about 3,400 uh, patients and some were uh, diagnosed by dentists and some were uh, carried out by the health workers and uh, when it comes to the dentist, out of the 106 uh, uh, lesions, suspicious lesions, all were uh, confirmed uh, remotely, suggesting there's a good concord, almost 100% concordance with the remote diagnosis versus uh, on-site diagnosis. When it comes to the health workers, not it, it was not uh, that accurate. We had some problems with the image acquisition and so on. But at least in a in a primary care. Uh, dental practitioners setting, this uh, technology appears to be uh, effective. So moving from that, uh, uh, that uh, mobile phone, this was led to the development of an app called Expertise uh, that is uh, currently being uh, uh, deployed in uh, different uh, uh, primary health centers and dentist uh, clinics. So essentially what it does is it can uh, uh, in, uh, inter, inter, interview different uh, uh, candidates, take images, and then uh, images can be interpreted uh, remotely. Then you recommend what should be the uh, follow plan. And uh, these are some of the screenshots of uh, the, the, the from the camera and uh, uh, from the mobile phone. 
and remote place, uh, this will be the dashboard. Each of the, the ID can be clicked and the image can be uh, uh, interpreted by a, a specialist. And not only that, it can uh, point map, uh, it can map where that uh, image is taken. So you can go back and uh, follow up uh, uh, on these uh, individuals. Now, there are issues with uh, this uh, technology. For example, a striae like this uh, from a tobacco chewing, you cannot uh, diagnose them. And uh, lesions such as uh, this uh, behind a, a tobacco could uh, uh, tobacco stain is difficult to interpret. So there are issues with uh, this uh, technology. So that is where the adjuncts, which I mentioned earlier, comes in. So these adjuncts uh, hopefully should be able to, to help uh, to can add to this uh, white light uh, imaging. So we can find out whether this uh, leukoplakia is a high risk or low risk, which needs an intervention, or an erythroplakia has uh, got a cancer or not. That can be that needs uh, some kind of uh, uh, additional uh, diagnostic uh, uh, te technology. So one such technology is the autofluorescence. You are familiar with that. Essentially, uh, it uh, integrates uh, tissue with a different wavelength and the different tissue fluoresce at different wavelengths. And when it comes to oral cavity cancer, you see NADH and collagen are the two molecules of interest. And uh, there is a uh, commercially available product called the Velloscope uh, that been uh, used, but there are issues, but uh, this uh, could be used in selected uh, situations to for interpretation. Now the question is whether we can incorporate that Velloscope along with the white light into the, uh, into the mobile phone. This is an ongoing project uh, supported by uh, NIH. Uh, run by Kirti. Kirti is a student or now she's a, a, a practicing uh, doctor uh, with uh, Dr. Praveen and uh, Gopan Song from uh, University of Arizona leads this uh, project. That's an ongoing uh, project. Now, another problem, as I mentioned, the fluorescence uh, is not specific. If there's a trauma comes, uh, a bite ulcer or something comes, that also can fluoresce because the collagen gets exp exposed and that has got problems. So instead of uh, having a, a, a standard autofluorescence, whether we can induce fluorescence or not, that is the challenge we took up in this project led by Santana, again from Praveen's group, and uh, Alex uh, from University of Minnesota uh, led this project. So what we did was we took the tissue, applied this uh, lectin, lectin binds to uh, this uh, malignant or neoplastic tissue because it, it expresses more uh, aberrant uh, glycosylated protein and that uh, can be fluoresced uh, using a particular wavelength and that can differentiate uh, uh, cancer uh, from a normal uh, benign ulcer and a precancer lesion. This was done in the ex vivo setting. Then we did a, a clinical validation by a clinical trial setting. So these are the different type of lesion uh, where this lectin was applied and then induced uh, the fluorescence using, uh, using the lectin and then uh, uh, imaged uh, uh, by this uh, fluorescent aid. As you can see that uh, varicose carcinoma uh, is brightly fluorescent. This lesion, even though we cannot see by white light, it uh, fluoresced under this uh, lectin. Uh, so this uh, subclinical lesion could be, uh, could be detected. Pemphigus normally regular fluorescent would have uh, lighted up, but uh, uh, lectin did not uh, uh, bind to this uh, uh, benign type of ulcer, so it could differentiate. So in this uh, small subset of about uh, 55 patients, sensitivity when it comes to malignancy was pretty high, about 100%. Specificity around 80, but pre-cancer we had issues about 80 uh, percent. Uh, sensitivity and same uh, specificity. Now, let us say that we have uh, suspected a lesion in the community. So what we normally do is we, uh, we refer the patient for a biopsy. Now, let us say there's a patient in Bellari, you ask them to come to Bangalore for biopsy, he or she will never travel. Now, what we need uh, in the community is a is a technology as or, or technique 
which is as close as uh, biopsy. And what is available right now in pathology is uh, cytology. So we ask the question whether we can uh, uh, diagnose oral cancer and pre-cancer by cytology. And uh, if it is uh, by cytology, instead of sending the slide to the specialist, whether we can take the image and send to the, to the remote pathologist to interpret or not. That's a question we took it up. So the first thing is that we have to validate whether cytology is effective or not. Uh, this was a, a study of about 82 uh, 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 patients. And if you look at uh, uh, whether you can differentiate cytology of cancer from a low grade dysplasia, pretty well it could differentiate 92% and specificity was about uh, 73, accuracy about 88. But when it comes to high-grade dysplasia versus low-grade dysplasia, cytology failed. But the cancer versus, say, low-grade dysplasia, it was good. Now, the question is whether we can send, uh, rather than looking the cytology directly, whether you can send it, uh, uh, take the images and send to a remote specialist or not. That was a project we took it up along with uh, Siemens as well as UC Berkeley. So this is a device uh, which uh, the uh, Berkeley group provided. Uh, this uh, device was initially used for uh, some of the larvae uh, diagnosis in Africa. So we adopted that for cytology and used for, uh, for the oral cancer uh, detection. So essentially you, you slide this, uh, the uh, cytology, uh, uh, slide under them the the, the uh, imaging device, take the images and send to the remote uh, uh, specialist for interpretation. So when it comes to direct microscopy versus telecytology, the accuracy was pretty good. Almost exactly whether you uh, look at uh, directly under the microscope or remotely, the accuracy was uh, pretty pretty good. Now, the problem we have was, as I said, uh, some of the oral uh, pre-cancer lesion, we could not, guys could not uh, differentiate whether they are high risk or low risk. Now, the question is whether we can uh, use machine learning to, to differentiate a high grade or low grade and even uh, fine tune that uh, uh, cancer diagnosis or not, that uh, project, uh, uh, we are currently doing that along with uh, Hardik Pandey at the Indian Institute of Science. Just a, a brief uh, uh, summary of that initial pilot phase of the study. So this was a study of about uh, 60 patients. The image was uh, captured. Then each image was rotated about eight different uh, planes. And this was uh, run through an organ called uh, monitor neural network. Don't ask me what it is. They are the... Uh, the uh, machine learning uh, formula, even the Google use. If you type in, for example, cytology, Google spin out uh, uh, the top uh, uh, hit by using this kind of uh, uh, algorithm to find out what is closest to what you ask for. And then uh, uh, it will segregate whether this is a uh, lesion, uh, high risk lesion or, uh, or low risk lesion. So just to summarize that, uh, uh, that uh, result, when it comes to cancer versus the high-grade dysplasia, uh, the accuracy was 65%, when it, the specificity was 100%, uh, uh, and accuracy was about 80%, uh, 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 so it's slightly better than the, the, the human uh, interpretation, but we have uh, some way to go. So just to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, uh, definitely technology is something we, sh we should be able to harness to, uh, to train, uh, to replace the trained eyes, uh, experts such as us, with to, to, uh, uh, to uh, take it up the community where it matters. And the, the type of technology to use depends on the where you have to do the intervention. For example, in a primary care setting, you can use this uh, uh, fluorescent or induced fluorescent type of uh, imaging uh, technique to uh, differentiate whether it's a suspicious or non-suspicious type of lesion. And when it comes to a dental practitioner's clinic or a primary care doctor's clinic, 
then we can bring in cytology or some other uh, method of uh, uh, sophisticated imaging uh, can be used so that the patient do not have to go to the, to the tertiary care facility uh, uh, without a firm a diagnosis so the compliance can be improved. So finally, I just want to thank the people who have done the work, even though I'm present in Trump Cochin Cancer Center, almost all the work uh, were done in Bangalore during my uh, time there. And uh, this is the lab group. The, the, the key people who have done the work are uh, Amrita Suresh. And there's one, for, this is my lab, and there's a clinical group. Uh, now, uh, Vijay is the, 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 the head of the department. Uh, Naveen left to, to, to Chennai, and it's a clinical service, uh, and this is the KME group, and one person common between all the three is uh, this person, Dr. Samsung, uh, he's doing PhD in the same area, and also, uh, uh, yeah, others in, in the group have done uh, amazing work to, to, uh, for this ongoing uh, project. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your kind uh, attention. Hello, Narayan. Can Thanks, you hear? That was, yeah, that was a wonderful talk. And I think a excellent summary of everything you've been doing and also the research that's being done. Uh, are there any questions? Anything that anybody wants to, sir, to discuss? I think that's... So we have a couple of questions that I just got. So one is the role of handheld uh, NBI probes in screening, narrowband imaging, and the role of AI in surveillance. I'll take the first one, the uh, narrowband imaging. Narrowband yeah. imaging is a very good technology when it comes to non-keratinized mucosa like uh, larynx and other areas. Uh, because the problem we have, essentially it looks at uh, the vascular pattern. And when it comes to oral cavity, uh, pre-cancer lesion, there's a thick uh, keratin layer there. So it, it is uh, difficult to interpret the, uh, the vascular pattern uh, happening in the subepithelial layer. So it's not that effective uh, in uh, oral cavity. Uh, second is the, uh, what was second question? Role of AI in surveillance. Oh yeah, that is uh, that definitely going to play a big, big role. Because if you look at, uh, uh, we've been using AI for the last uh, five years or so, and uh, the, the uh, uh, technology is changing every day, become more and more sophisticated. Uh, even we are using, let us say that uh, uh, the uh, health worker has taken an image, okay, and the image is not a satisfactory image, the uh, machine learning can immediately uh, tell the health worker you have not uh, picked the uh, right area. No, and then the other thing is that the health worker has to write a note that this is a right buckle, left buckle, and so on. Now with the machine learning algorithm, all they have to do is just a click, and then it will, uh, by uh, an anatomic landmark, it can separate which area it has taken. So that is a first layer. If you look at my our first paper, Praveen published health workers, the image quality was very poor. So that's why the concordance was very bad. So at that level, we can bring in machine learning. Now, highly sophisticated area like uh, cytology, uh, definitely it's going to make a huge difference. Because cytology, if you look at it, it's very effective when it comes to, to uh, the pap smear for cervical cancer. But uh, or cavity cancer doesn't work mainly because uh, the, the, the dysplastic cells, the atypical cells in the oral cavity can be due to trauma and other things. So it's not uh, objectively cannot characterize using human eye, but uh, with uh, machine learning and AI, definitely that's going to change. And particularly if you could add molecular cytology to it, and that is also going to come in the near future. So AI and machine learning going to uh, change the way uh, healthcare on the whole is being done. And a lot of uh, healthcare professionals tends to uh, criticize it 
and they don't adopt it. And that is at our peril. If you look at uh, chest X-ray, uh, you know, almost all the chest X-ray in a sophisticated labs are read by machine learning. CT scan will come, okay? And uh, a lot of image interpretation will go under the AI if we don't adopt uh, to that uh, evolution, uh, we will lag behind. I think so, because a lot of people think that AI is supposed to replace healthcare professionals. But the thing is, in a country like ours, there's already such a mismatch between demand and supply that when you look at a place like Bangalore, you may have plenty of head and neck oncologists, you may have head plenty of oncopathologists, but then you go 200 kilometers out, you have nobody. So I think the, a lot of the distrust and the fear comes from the belief that they're going to be replaced. Like, I don't know how many radiologists have actually been replaced with AI, for example, even in places where they have been using AI heavily. So I think it's just, uh, like you say, basically to help people who don't have access to things that we take for granted in tier one and tier two cities. Yeah, agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so another question that we're getting is, uh, is there any role of oral microbiome for screening of oral cancers? Not for screening per se, but uh, as a uh, uh, microbiome might uh, play a role in uh, as a causative agent for cancer. But I do, there is no need for a microbiome-based uh, uh, diagnosis of, uh, of cancer. But uh, saliva, yes, definitely saliva-based diagnosis uh, uh, will play a role uh, as initial screening. But microbiome, definitely, uh, because if you look at uh, the, 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 uh, the risk factors of uh, oral cavity cancer, buccal mucosa, yes, almost 80-90% of the patients will have uh, uh, local risk factors. But tongue, a large proportion do develop without any risk factors. Doesn't mean that it has, uh, there is no risk factor. There must be a risk factor like HPV, uh, which is yet to be diagnosed. So uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, microbiome research will uh, throw light into a positive uh, uh, agent for oral cancer development. I think so, because I think especially things like tongue cancer in younger patients with no risk factors, that's something that, uh, you know, we need to study in India because cumulatively we have enough numbers. If you look at, say, a 30-year experience from a big institution abroad, they'll have 50, 80 cases. Whereas, you know, if all of us pull together, that's something that we can really look at uh, in a critical way. Uh, so somebody's asked, are you involved in the government of India three common cancer screening initiative? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no. Uh, uh, here, uh, the reason is that uh, uh, health is, I work for the government, okay. Uh, the health is a, a state uh, portfolio. So health, even though the government, central government suggests certain things to do, state doesn't have to uh, follow them. Uh, we, the, the, uh, the ICMR has got three common cancer screening uh, projects uh, led by, uh, uh, I forgot uh, the, the, the subgroup which lead that. Uh, as, but the problem we try to adopt that in uh, one of the uh, uh, primary health settings, but it's, it's designed or developed by an IT person who has never gone to a village. You have a hundred, about three, four pages of uh, uh, sheets to complete uh, to uh, to screen a patient, that is not really practical. So you have uh, so it's a, even though the the objective the, the goal is good, uh, it is not uh, implemented properly. Uh, but uh, that is the way the, the future is going to be that way. So Kerala, what uh, they are doing is uh, similar. Three cancers are, di are being diagnosed at a district level. Uh, currently, we want to develop train the manpower using without any computer, just by uh, pen and paper. And then once that uh, skill is set up, it will be replaced by a digital platform for connecting uh, patient to the uh, specialist center. That will be great. Another question is, despite efforts, the reach of technology for screening has not been as wide as expected. So what are the hurdles? Is it just technological factors, human factors, or a combination of both? Yeah. 
See, technology alone will not work. Okay, uh, technology work uh, if there is a need for it. Okay, if there is a need, people adopt technology. For example, now we are using Zoom. When uh, we had conferences, we'll never. I don't like because I can't see who are listening to my talk. Okay, but we are using it because there's no alternative. It's the need of our. We are doing it. now. Such a need has to arise. so that has not come yet that has not come yet so that is one of the the the, the problem now it will come because i uh, see up until now uh, or oh, until about 10 years ago cancer was not a, not a big disease you know now non communicable diseases have surpassed the communicable disease so the in kerala the incidence is about 135 per 100000 now in about 10 or 15 years time it going to become 400 per 100000 that's a number uh, us has now 20 years behind, we looked before our number was about 76 per 100000 same in karnataka also almost similar number so most of this uh, uh, they they this is going to become extremely common uh, condition and we cannot uh, uh, but uh, cannot uh, uh, ignore it and the the and our health system do not have the capacity or the money to treat uh, advanced cancer okay. so best way to to give, provide affordable health care is by early detection so that is where the the need comes and then definitely we will have to adopt uh, technology uh somebody has asked does the oral screening app also help in tobacco cessation yeah see uh, if you ask uh, praveen it's a uh, a very good uh, tool okay uh, what they do is that they go to the community and then they take uh, pictures and then uh, show to the patient or pe- like can't say patient the uh, subject that this is your mouth this is how it looks and there is this white patch there and most of the time we say it's a uh, keratosis by putting this uh, tobacco pouch keratosis and if you tell them that you take it off uh, for about 3 months then um, it might uh, resolve so when they go for the second round they take the meter and show a large proportion of patient the the uh, uh, the lesion uh, will regress once they see the regression of the lesion uh, they get convinced so this is definitely a good tool uh, for uh, for uh, habit cessation okay so there is an unconnected question it says uh in relation to oral cancer how will you treat a lesion in the gingival buccal sulcus which on histology shows mild dysplasia moderate to severe dysplasia three scenarios mild dysplasia number 2 is moderate dysplasia number 3 severe dysplasia especially if it's in relation to the mandible or maxilla would you do a marginal mandibulectomy no i don't do anything at all uh, what i do so now we know that uh, potentially malignant lesion okay a uh, risk of malignant transformation vary from the grade of dysplasia okay now if i uh, treat the patient okay without treating the underlying cause i'm not treating i just tell them almost like putting a patch over a you know over a wound okay so if i do any intervention even if i prescribe some kind of uh, uh, medication uh, that is a, that is uh, not the right approach i always tell the patient that treatment is in your hand okay i always say that don't do anything okay uh, this uh, this is caused by tobacco uh, consumption uh, or little not chewing so you have to stop the habit so i always uh, tell them you come back after say one month or six weeks time okay and see whether they have complied or not okay and then i intervene now if the lesion is a carcinoma in situ then i know that i'm sitting on a, on a on a type of so i have to intervene in that situation i i do wide excision now whether i do a marginal mandibulectomy or not uh, i'm like so i just uh, take it off from the bone okay and then uh, entire uh, specimen will be uh, in the be looked at by the pathologist and if there is invasive area then definitely I'll go and do a marginal mandibulectomy otherwise i just uh, widely excise it 
think that's something that's always a little controversial. No? Do you over-treat or do you under-treat and wait? I think it depends on your, your level of skill, what kind of patient you're dealing with, how compliant they are, are they going to come for follow-ups? I think it's always a very difficult uh, question to answer in general. Uh, I think Sir's video is frozen. Sir, can you hear us? I think Sir's connectivity is poor. Hopefully, it'll come back in a second or two. Right. So, in the in the meantime, uh, Dr. Narayana, what is mm -hmm. your view? on chemo prevention do you think that it has a role to play in uh, in prevention of body cancer so we are actually doing a trial monisers the pi so what we are doing is we are looking at chemo prevention in multiple cancer centers in india and the agents that we are using are curcumin and metformin either individually or in a combination so it's a placebo controlled phase 3 randomized trial uh, and we are hopeful that we'll see some results. Because the problem with uh, chemo prevention in general has been that number one, uh, many of the agents were toxic. And number two, many of the agents, as soon as you withdraw usage of them, uh, the leukoplakic lesions uh, bounce back immediately. So unfortunately, it hasn't been something that has uh, shown to be extremely useful unlike in other cancers like um, you know breast cancer where you take tamoxifen for five years so i think there are multiple agents but the criticism is that none of them have actually been looked at in a large sample size uh, the problem with that is head and neck cancer in general uh, is something that we see a lot of in southeast asia it's not really something that we see in other parts of the world so nobody has much of an interest in uh, doing a large chemo prevention trial with 3,500, 4,000 patients, which is what we're aiming to do. Uh, so hopefully those two agents, we have had some success. Monisa has had some success basically on cell lines and other preclinical and cl uh, small phase one and phase two trials. So that's something that we are hopeful about. But as of now, I don't think there's any definitive data, unfortunately, that we can use clinically. So we're hoping that after the results of that trial come out, we should have something to say. Sir, you can hear us. Anything to add? Sir, I think you're on mute. Ah, yeah. we can hear you now. Right, okay. I'm sorry, am I, you know, I just got kicked out from the network. <laughs> So the question was on chemo prevention. Yeah, yeah. Chemo prevention, I think I, I agree with you that it's not uh, been very successful. Doesn't mean that we should stop looking for it, okay? Uh, so our group, particularly Amrita's group, Amrita and others are working on it. Uh, it is more difficult to cure pre-cancer than curing the cancer, okay? Because pre-cancer is closer to normal tissue compared to a cancer. Cancer is different from uh, uh, from a normal tissue. So uh, treating pre-cancer is more difficult. Now, our group is working on how to target stem cell, cancer stem cells to, to, to uh, prevent uh, cancer development. But that is some way to go. So currently, as of now, we don't have an effective uh, chemo preventive agent. Doesn't mean that our lab or the lab should not look for it. Uh, that should be pursued, but uh, right now there's nothing there. In the absence of it, what we do is we use the topical uh, retinoid uh, that we do. Uh, that definitely works. Uh, uh, but if, the moment you stop, uh, the lesion uh, comes back. But I don't give any antioxidants. All that uh, doesn't really work. Uh, somebody has asked, should allied health specialists like Ayurvedic and Ayurvedic doctors be involved in chemo prevention? Yeah. See, everyone has to play a role for that, not chemo. See, for example, our study using curcumin is an Ayurvedic product, uh, but it's a powerful, potent anti-inflammatory agent. Uh, so uh, we, our, that study was very, uh, it's a significant positive study. 67% of the patients uh, 
uh, uh, get a durable response by giving uh, 3.8 grams, I believe, of uh, uh, curcumin. That is very expensive, and taking that uh, for about six months is not that easy. Compliance is a problem. I think a lot of the success that you have in oncology comes from outside cancer centers, right? Involving the rest of the community and rather saying, you know, you know nothing about it, so just send it to me is not a reasonable approach because what happens is people get misdiagnosed, they get several rounds of steroids, inappropriate medication, and then so I think we need a lot more partnership with uh, non-oncologists in it if we want to actually be able to treat these patients early. So should we promote oral self-examination for the at-risk population? In fact, we did a study many years ago, 2003, published in uh, some 2005. Uh, the, the study was uh, not very, it was not a positive study, but uh, the, uh, it was uh, good as a, as a, uh, to improve the awareness. Uh, so you train the people, so you people uh, tends to know their mouth, how the mouth looks and so on. So any variation, they could uh, they could uh, uh, pick it up. Uh, so in that way, they, they and also uh, people were taught that uh, habits can cause cancer. So what are the signs of cancer and what are the causative agents for cancer? So the knowledge part increased, but it is not an effective uh, strategy for uh, detecting cancer. Uh, but in high risk individuals, I always, always tell even all my patients I tell them, look inside the mouth every day. Almost like a breast, uh, people talk to the women about, uh, they should know how their breasts feel like. So that is important, almost like a mouth, how they should know how the mouth looks like, where the lesions are. Uh, oral submucous fibrosis is a disease of South Asia. Can technology be used for its prevention? So for the prevention, uh, see the, the, what is required is a habit cessation. And habit cessation, whether technology can be used or not, uh, so there are some apps have come up uh, about, uh, see the problem is that smoking cessation or uh, chewing cessation, uh, smoking a lot of, uh, you know, uh, nicotine replacement uh, agents, agents have come. But uh, for uh, chewing, it is not just tobacco alone. It is that uh, the process of chewing, okay, uh, where there, there's no replacement has come. And also to, to sustain, uh, whether some kind of app can be used. Uh, maybe, yes, I think uh, those uh, needs to be developed. Uh, that India can do. Uh, what are the common chemo preventive agents used? So so I, I think you covered that. Yeah, retinoids and. Optical retinoid and then curcumin. Mm, any other questions? I, I think there is one more question uh, by Dr. Sutan Raj in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Okay. Ah. If you are treating a right buccal mucosal cancer by surgery, how will you manage a same sided tongue with submucosal? Oral submucous fibrosis and the other side precancerous condition. So I think he means like disseminated pre malignant lesions or potentially malignant lesions along with a frank cancer. Yeah. So the uh, most of the cancer which has developed in submucous fibrosis is uh, from the field cancer. So we cannot go on. <laughs> A dysplastic uh, mucosa or pre cancer lesion of the mouth. So, what we have to do is we treat the cancer and then uh, habit cessation and constant surveillance. So, the moment the patient develop a, a, a high grade uh, dysplastic lesion, excise it, topically excise it. Uh, but the more you excise, more scar tissue they develop and the more Christmas uh, patient develop. So, it's a catch 22 situation. 
but you just have to uh, slowly go and uh, take one after another. I have a patient, she's a professor uh, in one of the uh, major uh, institute of uh, our country. We have done about 26 surgeries uh, in her mouth, but uh, everything under control, uh, but had about several free flaps and so on. Uh, but they are, uh, we have to treat one after another. Uh, there's no uh, easy way out. I think this is another peculiarity. You know, you see a lot of patients with fifth and sixth and seventh cancers with no tobacco use or no, uh, you know, nothing that predisposes them to malignant transformation. But I think ironically, they do quite well. If you excise it completely and you give them adequate treatment, they have to suffer the morbidity of all those procedures, but they still survive for quite a long time. But very often, I don't think we get answers to why they have it. Yeah, agree. Uh, what protocol would you follow in um, T slash T of carcinoma due to HPV? Sorry, I don't follow that. Um, treatment, is it? Treatment of cancer due to HPV, I guess. Are you talking about oral cancer or oropharyngeal cancer or... Let's clarify this. Up. The oral cavity cancer is not caused by HPV. Okay, very very small number. Uh, initially, there was some. Uh, even we published a high percentage in one of our initial publications, but that was a technique error because PCR amplify and cause uh, false uh, uh, positive uh, um, results. But the oral cavity cancer is not is not caused by HPV. But the oral pharynx cancer, tonsil and base of tongue are caused by HPV. Uh, so that is treated primarily by non-surgical methods. Yeah, so I think they've clarified what protocol would you follow in treatment of CA tongue due to HPV? HPV? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but most of the time, HPV related, uh, uh, pure HPV related uh, oral tongue is rare. Most of the time, even if the P16 positive, there will be associated uh, risk factors like smoking or chewing. So you treat like any other oral cavity uh, cancer, not treated by primary radiotherapy. Yeah, I think that's still a sticky area because even HPV positive and negative oropharyngeal cancer, there's no official change in the recommendation on how you treat the patient. Your ability to treat them with limitation of morbidity depends on whether they need chemotherapy and adjuvant therapies and things like that. So I think that again is something that you need to personalize for each patient rather than generalize. Yes. Um, anything else? So if there's nothing else, I might ask you one question before we end. So what would you think is the role of a practitioner? So somebody who is not really involved in public health, you know, somebody who's not part of research, somebody who is practicing either in a primary, secondary, or uh, tire one, tire two, tire three city, city, what would you say is their role in screening? Yeah, see, the, uh, see, all of us are healthcare professionals. Our responsibility to keep the, the well-being of the person sitting in front of you looking after. So our responsibility to pick up the cancer at early stage and uh, we have a primary care doctor uh, you have the responsibility to look for uh, like you check the blood pressure diabetes you have the responsibility to look for the most common cancers, uh, uh, breast cancer with already cancer and now uh, increasing number of colon as well as uh, the lung cancer so these uh, cancers need annual uh, uh, evaluation that's our responsibility and uh, we should not say that oral cavity belongs to dentists. It's everybody's responsibility. Similarly, dental practitioners tends to focus only on the teeth without looking at the, uh, the mucosa and other areas. That is also not uh, appropriate. And the problem is that uh, none of us wants to diagnose cancer uh, because it's, a, it's not a good diagnosis to give. Okay? So there's a denial both from the patient side as well as from, from the practitioner side. But um, 
imagine if we can diagnose cancer early stage, but it's a very, very curable condition and save lives. I think that's an excellent point. So many patients who get referred to us, I see so many patients, none of whom actually know the diagnosis. Whoever has referred them has very rarely actually told them that they have cancer. They've just been told, you know, go and see this person. They'll tell you what the issue is. Yeah. I think it's a bit of a taboo. Nobody wants to be the breaker of bad news. But I think we probably need to move away from that mentality because otherwise you lose precious time. And I think something also we can all be aware of is uh, tobacco cessation. So the basic psychology of addiction and things are basic are things that we should all be familiar with, whether you're a head and neck oncologist or not, whether you're primary care physician. These are all things we should take a bit of an interest in rather than thinking, you know, go and see a psychiatrist, go and see a psychologist. I think these are things that we can incorporate in our daily practice. Even if you can get one or two patients to stop smoking in your career, that's a pretty big thing. Are there any other questions? Anything else anyone wants to ask, sir? I don't think so. It doesn't look like anything else. I think uh, young surgeons like us have so much to learn from you, from radical surgeries to radical thoughts. I mean, you know, there's, there's a wealth of knowledge there. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for joining us today and taking time to educate us about your endeavors. And, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of us would have some stimulating thoughts now running as to how we can start our own uh, initiatives. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Narayan. It's a pleasure having you here with us. And, uh, Thanks a lot. You did a wonderful job with this. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Thank I would you. like I would Senior, Senior, Dr. Dr. Vishal Rao, and Dr. Akshay Kupaje, without whom we couldn't have initiated uh, this endeavor of ours. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Anand Subhash, Dr. Bhargav, and Dr. Ritvi, and all our fellows for helping us coordinate and execute uh, this session. So, uh, to the audience, please join us for the next session uh, on the coming Thursday. Uh, we'll keep you updated as to the topic of the same. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.